So good to see you this morning. Many of you, sometimes uh, some of you I haven't seen for a while, just good to see you again and um, trusting for a good 2023 for us. Amen. Perhaps uh, 2023 could surprise you to the upside and um, really trusting and praying that God would, uh, I felt God, as I said to you last week, saying, um, don't look down on 2023, look up and uh, expect some good things. Uh, we didn't start the year well, our government is in disarray, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. we know about all that, and uh, everyone's talking about getting solar panels and all sorts of crazy things just to live, but we are a plucky nation, amen? We are a strong people. I believe that this nation of ours, a mystery nation, a nation, the guys in America are phoning, they're saying, oh, you guys are right, are you surviving? Even my own family, Mauritius, saying, you better get over here quickly, and I keep on saying, we are an unusual people. We have an unusual and a broken past, and I believe we have an open heavens. Sometimes we look down and we have a broken earth, but we have an open heavens. And then the prayers from this nation have been extraordinary, amen? And um, probably God is most interested in our brokenness. The nations that are like Melbourne, that are completely together, that have everything imaginable, uh, don't really need God. We need God every day, amen? And so that's why we are a praying, calling out people. I want to talk to you this morning, uh, uh, the continue my preach from last week, which was um, such a great salvation, and I want to continue it, um, talking about such a great salvation. Uh, I don't know what happened to me, but in 1978, 79, probably starting 77, uh, I got saved uh, reluctantly. I didn't want to get saved. I resisted, but yet I was utterly intrigued by what I heard. I was fascinated. I was gripped. I was at times angry that I didn't know about the, the Jesus Christ and the gospel. I'd been to church, but eventually I surrendered my life as C.S. Lewis was a reluctant convert. I think I was, but the day that I made the call, the day that I said, okay, Lord, I surrender. I look to you is the day that I experienced the radical salvation of Jesus. I don't know why, I sometimes go back and say, what messages were preached? Because some people heard the gospel, but have since fallen away. That's just the truth. I'm very sad about that. Even some of our friends have fallen away. Um, radically, some of them, some have gone from just off the edge to all the way to the complete um, falling away, as it were. If that is possible, theologically, day for another discussion. But I, I've often thought, Lord, what was it? that captured my heart. And um, I think part of it is that actually something of the radicalness of Jesus can be yours, it can be mine. And I don't think there's a single person in this room that says, I wanna be kind of lukewarm, I wanna be average. Um, every one of us want to serve Jesus, amen? With all of our hearts and all of our minds. And, um, and part of uh, the difficulty or the reality is we might get saved, uh, then we have expectations, then things begin to happen. You may get shackled. We spoke about the shackles. You may get very disappointed. You may be confused theologically. It may be that you find that within your own soul, you have the desire and the longing for the things of God, and then the next day you want the things of the world, and you want the things of darkness, and then there's, a, there's part of your member or your, your, your inner person that loves God. There's another part that doesn't want God, doesn't want to go to church, doesn't want to worship, wants the things of the world, wants the, the morsels and the trinkets and the shiny things that this world so keenly offers us, as uh, Ingrid said, our darting eyes, our distractions. And so sometimes you find this war within you and sometimes you want to capitulate and surrender to sin and surrender to whatever it may be and just surrender to your own flesh and carnality and uh, all that is in the scriptures. We're vulnerable here on earth. We're vulnerable to stuff. We're vulnerable to sickness. We're vulnerable to accidents. We're vulnerable to disappointments. We're vulnerable to churches closing. We're vulnerable to losing our marriages. We're vulnerable to losing our businesses. And if you have an overdeveloped kingdom now theology, which is a big word that says, uh, well, I expected, you know, that... Um, 
I'm saved. I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me. Why do I doubt? Um, people prophesied over my business, over my children, and now look what's happened. And all these prophetic words, can I trust them? And so we become subject to the vagaries <laughs> and the realities of this robust and at times difficult and at times suffering world. Amen? How do we keep going? How do we keep burning? The scripture demands faith and obedience and uh, giving. You know, I gave a guy a car guard, only 50 rand. I said, have you got change for me yesterday? And I thought, why? Why don't I just give him the 50 bucks or the 100 bucks? Why just 10? And the Bible says to me, you must give. And I'm, I'm torn between, uh, I keep on giving every car guard or a tithe or, you see, and then, and it's a good battle, Amen. And it's a good battle to be obedient and then to pray and to practice the way and to give my tithes. And so all these things in addition, how do we do it? Unless we see this great salvation, we will lose hope, amen? Because the world is saying, we have a great planet for you. We have great promises for you. Your career is important. You've got to marry the best man in the world. You've got to marry the best woman. You've got to have the best house. You've got to have the best church. You've got to have the best kids ministry. And then God shakes us and he gives us a thorn in our flesh. Unless you see the greatness of this salvation, it's going to be difficult that you are saved by such a great Savior that we can know him intimately. And I want to say this to you. You can know Jesus intimately. That will sustain you and keep you all the way to the end in spite of what may beset you or what may happen to you. And so if you read in Hebrews chapter 2, that I will turn there, it talks about this great salvation. The writer to the Hebrews is writing to the Jews who are busy backsliding. They're saying, this is too hard. This Jesus story, we'd rather go back to the ways of Moses because living with Jesus, um, this Messiah, you know, like the Jews are persecuting us, the Romans are persecuting us, uh, our families don't want us to fellowship at the bar mitzvahs and the weddings, and then the writer says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away, for if the message spoken by angels, the old message, the law was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. How shall we, this is us, the church, how shall we escape if we ignore what? Such a great salvation. So you won't find that in Israel that they were saved, that it was called such a great salvation. It was called a salvation which appears about 320 times in the Bible. Salvation, saved, saves, okay? So he says, you don't ignore if we, how shall we escape? Escape what? What are we going to escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord. So the Lord announced it in his word throughout scriptures. There's this later saying, doesn't matter what the Bible says. Don't quote for the Bible says. I want to counter that and says, Jesus quotes it many, many times from the scriptures. And when he came, he said, this is what was said. The, the, even Paul, they said, this was announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So one of the things is that there are all these people, they said, no, no, we were there. We touched him. We heard. We saw the miracles. We saw him raise the dead. We saw him walk on water. We saw him in the tomb. We saw him ascended into heaven. We can testify. We heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts that were given. People were given gifts of healing, gifts of ministry, gifts of preaching. So the, all these evidence and signs and gifts distributed to people according to his will. And so this is a great salvation which after a while can become less and less and less and less until it's just ah. Uh, I don't know if I believe in heaven and hell. I don't know if I believe God would be so tough. And so some scriptures I'll quickly read to you. It's great, number one. Number two, proclaim it. In other words, I need to proclaim, even to my wife. We, we live together. We don't have any, well, obviously we, have to get, we don't have any kids at home. Well, not often. And so we, we can spend a lot of time fellowshipping, 
a lot of time talking. Proclaim it. 1 Chronicles 16, proclaim his salvation day after day. My mouth must declare how great God is, irrespective of how my soul is. Number three, rejoice in his salvation. My heart, Psalm 13, 5, my heart rejoices in your salvation. I don't feel saved. I'm not sure if I'm saved. Rejoice in his salvation. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 16 says, love his salvation. May those who love your salvation say, the Lord be exalted. That thing of Solomon was that after he, had ded he dedicated the temple, he was on his knees in front of the whole of Israel. He lifted up his hands to heaven and he looked upon heaven and he just thanked God for his kindness and his mercy. And he says, we love you and we love your ways wholeheartedly. I think number, number five, thank him. I will give you thanks. Psalm 118 verse 21, you have become my salvation. I will give you thanks, O Lord. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you think, huh, hard day, my wife and I are disagreeing, car's broken, dog's dying, problems, or, and you can just go into a hole, I'm stressed, I'm depressed, or you can, I thank you this morning. Sun's shining, leaves are green, the lurries are chirping, I want to thank you. And all these things take their rightful place. Number, number six, I long for your salvation. That's also final salvation. There is a final salvation coming, brothers and sisters, that will make this salvation a little bit pale when the consummation of the, of the time will come, when Jesus returns. Long for it. Long for him to save you now, the things that you're facing. Number seven, clothe yourselves with it. I mean, I, I've got 13. I will clothe her, her priests with salvation. This is the one that I particularly love. Number eight, it's your crown, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully. Today we will go and have lunch, cut an hour, with people that are perhaps not so much in the body, that are, have invited us, beautiful, very successful, wealthy people, very kind of them. And uh, I want to walk into that house as a pastor, they will think, oh, he's a pastor. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know what a pastor is meant to be. We are all prophets, amen? We should all be worshiping. But I want to wear, I want to, I want to, I want to have a shiny crown when I walk in there today, amen? Hoppers 12. Uh, how's, how's the Germany? I want to wear my crown of salvation, amen? Let it, it's your crown. The Lord delights, Psalm 149, verse 4. His people, he crowns the humble with salvation. Number eight, drink from the wells with joy. Isaiah 12, you will draw from the wells of the water of salvation. Number 10, it's for everyone who believes. If you're here this morning and you say, I'm a mess. If you're a troubled soul, if you have committed bad things, it's for all who believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's a power for salvation for everyone who believes. Okay, that's number 10. Number 11, he does not long to bring judgment, but salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. God has not appointed you to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. People say, I can't cope with a, with a God of, of judgment or wrath. Let me ask you this. That teaching that says, so people who do what they're doing right now in Ukraine, who are obliterating cities just, just now, who are raping, killing, murdering old people, who have taken the life's work of countless people. No, we, we, we don't want you to get angry, God. No, we do. We have to serve a God who, who will bring judgment. Because otherwise this world will be chaotic. If you take judgment and wrath and people say, you may survive this, but you will face wrath. But God doesn't want you to face wrath. He wants you to be saved. Amen? He wants all those people that are doing what they're doing to be saved. He wants them to stop and, and, and move out of wrath and come into salvation and fall on their knees and say, I'm guilty of genocide or whatever. And one can go on and on about the stuff going on in the world. We need the wrath of God to come to clean out. Amen? Somebody give me an amen. <laughs> Otherwise, whatever, Grandpa, let the people take young girls, abduct them into cars, 
inject them with drugs, and rape them until they are in their 40s and 50s. Hold them captive. The wrath of God must come, amen, to clean that out. But he says, I don't want you to suffer wrath. I want you to enjoy salvation. But I want you to repent. Keep moving. It's his to give. Your salvation belongs to our God. Unless we see it as such a great salvation, brothers and sisters, we will treat it casually. Israel forgot. It's interesting that God says to pay careful attention. He's referring to Israel. Israel forgot their groans. The, the word remember is, is, is mentioned countless times in the scriptures, Old Testament. They forgot their tears, their groans, their cries from slavery. They forgot that the Lord cast the horse and the rider into the sea. They forgot the great winds of the Spirit that when Moses stretched out his staff, he opened the seas and they walked through on dry ground. They forgot the manna and they forgot the quail and they forgot the water that sprung clean crystal drinking water. They forgot the Torah and the, and the law that came down from this man who had been on the mountain. They just forgot and few entered the paradise because they forgot. And that's why we are a teaching people. Some of the Israelites didn't experience miracles. Some of the Israelites through the centuries were told, you know what happened? That's what God did. Tell it to your children. Tell it when they walk on the streets. Tell it when they lie down. Tell it, read about it, declare it, remember it. Amen. And you might be having never experienced a miracle of God. But I want to say to you, it is a great Salvation. They wandered in the desert aimlessly and two got in. What a great salvation. We prayed about burning hearts and passion. It's interesting that people think if I go on mission, if I give, if I'm good to my wife, you see, Jesus empowers that. When you try and be empowered in that area without an intimate and close relation with Jesus, you will run out of steam. You will, you, will, you, will, you will struggle to continue unless there's a fire of passion burning for you. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, this is the great salvation. I'll just read it to you. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. It's a big statement. But I was alive. No, but you, you had no connection to God. You had no relationship. As far as God were concerned, you would just be a matter of time and you would be gone. But you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. And some of us, brothers and sisters, are more susceptible to the drawings of the world. I said to Kati, as much as I, I'm a, I, I love to build things, I'm a bit of a DIY guy, there comes a stage when I cannot look at another magazine and want another table or bookshelf or lights or... Because sometimes I'm thinking, Lord, I just want another one. I want another one. How much do you want? It's the, sometimes the ways of the world. Now, in themselves, they're not bad, but they can become bad. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that spirit, that, that one that's in the air, the spirit who is now at work of those who are disobedient, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. We were, that's what we were. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, which meant it was inevitable that the wrath of God would come for all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. And he said it's... We were objects of wrath. It was just a question of time before we'd experience the wrath of God. Great salvation, great salvation being spoken about here. But because, here it comes, but because of his great love for us. He just said, he just said I love you, I love you. And we've been speaking about that different theme. God who is rich in mercy. That, that Muslim man I spoke about, that Iranian man. He did everything. He was a good guy. As countless Muslims are good people, sometimes much better than Christians, much more hospitable, much more righteous, but they always carry guilt because they, they just can't get this thing of guilt off of them. This man, as good as he was, 
was told Jesus died for your sins, Issa died for your sins, and suddenly he'd made sense to him. The spirit quickened him, and he felt the instant relief and the washing of his soul by the forgiveness of his sins by this man Jesus, who even the Quran speaks about, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even while we were dead in our transgressions. So from, you know when Jesus walked past a dead person, happened three times I think, he just said, arise, awaken. Dead person can do nothing. And he said he made us alive. Like he raised the dead, so he raises us. As well. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved and God raised us up with Christ and has seated us with with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we were dead in transgressions. In a sense, we just had to say yes, and he would raise us. So he would raise us, and not just raise us, but seat us with Christ in heavenly places. This great salvation, brothers and sisters, is the greatest news in the history of the world. It's the greatest news in the history of the world. Not the bicycle, not the wheel, not the internet, not penicillin, salvation. We have been saved from the judgment of God, from captivity, and from Satan. You are no longer dead. We are no longer objects of wrath. We are no longer under judgment to come because God who is rich in mercy. Remember God will say, no, 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 Nick, don't come with your thing that, that you found me harsh. I love you and I am rich in mercy. So much so that I sent Jesus to die for you. Don't neglect it, because how will you escape if you neglect such a great salvation? And so I think the church, brothers and sisters, in this new world of 2023 and tolerance is, is watered and washed down and blended more rather than being a crown of salvation. And I want to say, man, I'm, hello, I'm Nick Hardy, how are you? So, so who are you? Ah, oh, me, I'm a son of God. I'm saved. I've been, I'm loved by God. I've been seated in heaven. Are you weird, bro? No, not weird. But I, I, I want to tell you about this Jesus because Israel was a nation that should glow under God's saving hand. Amen? So this Savior Jesus, I want to say this about him. This Jesus, who is our Savior, you know the frescoes in the St. Peter's and the paintings of Jesus and the Last Supper 2,000 years ago, bro. It's a relic. He said some words 2,000 years ago. What does that have to do with us today in 2023? You know what Jesus, what Revelation 1:18 says? I am the living one. <laughs> I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus Christ is timeless, amen? Even though he was born 2,000 years ago, he belongs to every culture on the planet. Now, today, he is not dated. Jesus is not dated. Muhammad is, Abraham is, Paul is, but Jesus is not dated because he lives, he's the living one. He speaks to all people today in their vernacular. He speaks and can relate to all people, Nepalese, Chinese, Japanese, Congolese. Give me another ease. Frenchies. <laughs> can speak to all people in their culture, in their vernacular, in their day, from the insane America that's doing crazy things all the way to the primitive people. He knows their food. He understands their language. He knows their sexuality and all the stuff that goes. He is contemporary and he is current and he awaits you and I in our future. He is already in 20. 2100. He is already in 2050. He's not caught by surprise by our, the internet and our technology and the new doctrines of the day. He is timeless, amen? He is our contemporary. He is of today. 
What does the Galilean carpenter know? Everything. Everything. He knows that the Chinese would send a balloon over America and like the oak, shot it out the sky. And he knows there was a young girl swimming yesterday in, was it Melbourne or I don't know where, in Australia, going to swim with dolphins and a shark ate. So he knows everything. He knows everything about the United Nations and he knows he rose from the dead and he is alive forevermore and he is available and accessible to all who call on his name. He cannot be related and relegated to the history books. He is active. He is ahead of you, sir. He awaits you, sir. He is the good shepherd and he goes before us. He awaits us in the month of March. He awaits us in Cape Town. All our routes are down there and Tula and Peter, they're going to help with the worship. He awaits you. He is in our future and he says, come. He isn't caught by surprise, amen? That's why he's the only one that you can trust because all of our gurus and all of the, even Christian leaders are trying to predict the future. Go to Jesus. He awaits you. He is the living one. He reigns at the right hand of God. The man, Jesus Christ, he is still fully human and he is fully divine. Go figure. This great salvation, he is not, he has a glorified humanity. He is fully God and he is fully human. <laughs> Which means that we will enjoy a glorified body with him. We won't be fully divine, but we will enjoy. But Jesus you see, the Israelites said, well, we don't understand you, God. You're too far away. you God, and we human. You're distant. Your ways and our ways, they're different. we broken and sinful. We like to do things. you God, and but God says, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll help you. I will send the God-man, and, and he will, he will he, this is how you're to live, and you're to find yourself in him. Isn't that beautiful? So he reigns at the right hand of God. And then he pours out his spirit into us and he says, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my spirit. One of my great themes is to live by the spirit. Well, I'm a very reformed kind of person, very intellectual kind of person. Sir, sir, you need the spirit of God. You need the spirit of God to enable you. Don't leave until you've been filled with power on our, I will give you a promise. I will pour out my spirit. How do you do this without the spirit? I have no idea. And you might think, well, Nick, you know, I just, I don't know about the Spirit, and I'm very scared of crazy charismatics. I'm Ask the Spirit to fill you. Ask the Spirit to quicken and enable you, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You've got to get your settings right. Get your settings right. All this new technology, settings are wrong. Get this, go back to the manual, get set. See, sometimes we need our daily, our weekly fix of Jesus. Many people just say, okay, what must I do? Oh, yeah, I've got to, my, I've got to get my weekly fix. I like, I've got to go to the doctor for my checkup. I go every five years and I get checked up and they burn all the chacha out of my skin, all the warts and all the little cancers. They get burnt out, stuff. And he says, why, why haven't you been here for so long? Why did you take five years to come back? I always get told that. Jesus is not our genie in the bottle, our Saint Christopher. He is the living one. When you drive, when you fly, whatever you do, you're saying, Jesus, I fix my thoughts on you. Can you say, oh, this is a great salvation? Does the salvation absorb you? Does Jesus grab your heart? I realized at one stage I wanted Jesus at arm's length, been through different stages. Sometimes Jesus is just like arm's length. He says, I don't do arm's length. I don't do genie in the bottle. I don't do St. Christopher. I want you to come to me. I want you to have all of me because you can't do it, Nick, part-time. I want everything must come together. John 5, 24, available to us now. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And I just want to touch on that. And will not be condemned. He's crossed over from life to death. In other words, he has it 
now. So, so you can experience eternal life now. You can enjoy it now. You don't have to have it someday, amen? We see at the end of time the consummation, the fullness, but you can have eternal life. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life now, amen? Sometimes you need to bring this life into your home, into your children. You say, my children are battling. How do you bring the life into your marriage? How do you bring the life? You have it now. He who does not have the Son does not have life. But if you have the Son, you have light, life. Nicodemus, they say, to quote Tim Keller, what is a born-again Christian? They say, now those are... Everyone will give you a different opinion of what a born-again Christian is. They say, what, what is, like, are they emotional? They're like very emotional. They, they're normally drug addicts, come from prison, murdered a few people, they had countless affairs, smoked weed, but now they, 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 they need a crutch, so they're born again. There's all different stereotypes. To me, a born-again Christian, all his men know this is the real deal. When, I, when people say born again in the news, it's like, no, this is, this is one that's, this is the real deal, amen? Emotional, uh, happy clappy, very exuberant, um, cries a lot. <laughs> Those are born again Christians. Nicodemus was a man who went to Jesus quietly. He was a, of the ruling council, he was a Pharisee. He was a very level-headed man, probably a rich man. Um, a man of status, a man of standing, a man who knew the Torah, uh, wasn't emotional, uh, probably didn't cry a lot. And he went to Jesus and he said, I, I see that. And, and he called him rabbi, which meant he, he gave him an, a, a title of honor. Rabbi. What are the Pharisees that want to take Jesus out? He comes along and he, he says, he calls him rabbi. He acknowledges. Amazing man, actually. Your teacher that's come from God, no one could perform the miraculous signs you didn't accept God were with them. Because I tell you the truth, no one can see. In other words, see means, ah, oh, I see. No one can see the kingdom unless he is born again. What? So slowly, Jesus, what are you talking about? How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus said. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. These are highly intellectual, studied um, men and women, men who are selected to continue the traditions of Israel. Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. You cannot even enter, let alone first you cannot see, but now you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born of water and the spirit. What, what people say, think it's baptism. I think it's water being the cleansing, the washing that, that Jesus washes your sins away and the Spirit. So the Spirit does something in you. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Why are you surprised that, that you must be born again? You should know these things. He's saying something needs to happen to you, Nicodemus. In other words, when a child, we've said this before, when a child is born, they don't have to do anything. They just have to be born. The person that does the work is the midwives and particularly the mother who will stress and strain. Something must be implanted in you by the Spirit. That right? You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Something, when you put your faith in Jesus, is given to you and given to me. It's a new life. It's the born, you're born again of an incorruptible seed. Amen? And if that doesn't happen, it's just religion. If that doesn't happen, I just got to be a good guy. So Sunday, it's at our only church. We were late this morning because I was changing my notes, and I thought, I just love that prayer meeting. I love that prayer meeting. Sometimes I don't love prayer meetings, but I particularly like the Sunday morning prayer meeting, maybe because I'm desperate. <laughs> Sometimes a Thursday prayer meeting, which is probably the most meet, important meeting of this church, happens on a Thursday, and many times it's a strain. But the number of times Katie and I drive, and we think, what an amazing prayer meeting. There is a seed, a new seed, an incorruptible seed that was planted. The kingdom of God is like a farmer that went out and sowed seed. And the seed eventually lands in good soil and it produces a crop. It's a great salvation. People say like, how did you become a pastor, bro? 
Like, what's wrong with you? Do you, do you, do you give 10% of your money every month of your salary? <laughs> what a joy. What a joy. Do you, do you like spend hours and hours talking to people about their problems? Yeah, shepherd. How, how do you even do that? Some guys said, I can't bear to sit with another person. How do you do that? It's the new life. It's the spirit, amen? Why do Dave and Chris and the guys go to Lesotho and sleep in cold or hot or wet? And so it goes on and on. Yes, Saturday, the first guy was burnt at the stake for, for, the, for, for, for being reformed in the 1500s. He's at the stake with his hands worshiping. They're burning him. I think Queen Mary of Scots, is it? They're burning him because he believes in the in saved by faith, not by works. Gladly. <laughs> There's a new thing inside of you. Are you alive there? Are you breathing? Something Nicodemus. In fact, Nicodemus, they say, Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea were so touched, this is Keller speaking now, that when they went to get the body of the executed Jesus, they went and urgently asked for the body of the leader of the sect that had just been crucified. You've got to be out of your head to ask for the body of a man that's just been crucified because he's a heretic and asked for his body and they embalmed him, which is what women and slaves do, not men, and they stuck him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, it's like saying something happened to Joseph of Arimathea that is like unthinkable that he would, you don't want to be associated with man because you yourself could lose your life. Never underestimate the power of the new life inside of you. Amen? And my plea this morning, my cry this morning is, is it a great salvation? Has the devil shackled you? Has he thrown a blanket over you? Are you tired of the things of the kingdom? Or does this thing, does the kingdom live in you? These men, these ordinary fishermen, tax collectors, changed the world because of the salvation in their hearts was so great. They experienced a great salvation and a great savior. Don't let your old life dominate your new life. There's this tussle. Paul speaks about in Romans 7. This is all this tussle. But eventually the one you feed will overcome the one that you don't feed and eventually you'll be free. Don't let your old life dominate you. The superior power of God, the new birth reorders things in your life, your affections, your passions, your desires. And I want to ask you this morning, have you experienced this new life? Something has been planted into you. We know the story of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers ever, perhaps. Young man, he's on his way to church and snowstorm, he goes to um, Baptist church, snowstorm, he's got to go to the completely nondescript, very average church around the corner because of the snowstorm and he gets to a Methodist church. And the snowstorm is so bad that even the preacher can't get there. So there is a very average layman who d- decides, well, he better get up and speak because there's no one else to speak. There's four or five people, some say maybe less in the church. It's a very forgotten thing. This layman who's a bad preacher, to quote Spurgeon, quotes Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved all, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there's no other. This man, Spurgeon, was trying his best to be a good Christian, he, he had a desire for ministry, and he was obsessed with, with trying to get it right, trying to live well, and this guy gets up and, 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 and speaks this. He says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. He also related to that is the story of Israel in Numbers 21 or 22, I forget now, that, that's were bitten by snakes. The, the, they rebelled, they were bitten by snakes. We know the story well. And the, God sent a plague of, of venomous vipers and began, I mean, they were everywhere. They were in your tent. If you walked in, the, they would bite you. And there was like a plague of, of, of um, snakes. And 
they began, people just began to die. Many died. And then while they were being, had the venom and being bitten and dying, which sometimes you don't die instantly with these vipers, it takes you maybe a day or so, God says to Moses, make a bronze serpent and, and lift it on a pole. And whoever looks at the snake or the serpent will be healed. So they, they couldn't do anything. All they had to do was just to look. They just had to see. They couldn't go to it. They couldn't touch it. They couldn't pay homage to it. They couldn't bring sacrifices to it. All they had to do while they were frothing and dying is, is look, and if they looked, they would be healed. Turn to me and be saved. They don't have to be good. They don't have to deserve. They don't have to do anything in your sick and dying state. Look to me. It hit Spurgeon like a ton of bricks that he had been trying to save himself by his good works. He says he, he, says he looked and he looked and he looked again until he looked his eyes out. He so began to be transfixed and transformed by beholding Jesus that his life was completely turned around and he realized I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be good. I simply have to look. People say so-and-so has found themselves. They've looked, they've been on a search and they've found themselves. You don't want to find yourself because when you find yourself, you will find trouble. You will find despair. You will find brokenness. Amen. You will be disappointed. But if you look to him, you will be saved. This, the, the preacher said to him, there was five people. He says, he says, young man, you look miserable. This lay preacher has this moment, this prophetic moment and says, you look miserable. You need to be saved. Look to Jesus, miserable young man. <laughs> and this miserable young man realized it hit him that all he had to do was look and he would be saved. Fix your gaze. Fix your eyes. Look at me. And he began, look to me, I'm shedding my blood. Look to me, I have been cursed. Look to me, I'm forsaken, punished, pierced yet innocent, crucified and cursed yet sinless, forgiving my murderers. Look to me, keep on looking as I die. Keep on looking as I'm buried. Look as I'm raised again. Look as I'm ascended into heaven. Look as I send you the Spirit. He said, I'm ready to do 50 things to be saved. The preacher said, just look, gaze. This thing of, of, um, that Francis has been speak, speaking about is take time to look. Take, take time to see. If you get him, your life will change. If you get him, you will begin to declare. You will begin to prophesy. You will begin to live victoriously. Why don't you stand with me? I want to pray for us. You can go to church every Sunday, Sunday school. But I would encourage you. I would encourage you to get to know this Jesus, to get to see him, amen? To get to behold him. Because once you do, you will be released to do the things that God has for you to do. Only you know whether you've received the salvation. Only you know whether the new life is living inside of you. No one else knows that. Maybe your spouse knows that. Ah, I don't know. Only you know if you've been translated from that something has come into you that's, 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 that's made a huge difference. Only you know that. Can you drift? Yeah. But, but but even this morning, we say, Lord, I want to change course. I want to fix my eye. He causes you to obey. He causes you to long. He causes you to want to worship. He causes you to want to pray. He causes you to give thanks. The fruit of the Spirit begins to emerge not the works of the Spirit, it's the fruit. It, it just pops out of you. Love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness. I don't give, Lord. I want to worship you. Religion can be stuff. Our job is to take you to Jesus. He reorientates your affections. Receive Christ as your Savior today. Ask Him, say, Lord, I'll come in. If you're not sure that you're saved, if you're not sure, then you're not. You're not. Then you're, then, then you're not. But I want to encourage you to say, open your heart, open your life. 